power and energy versus force. So we have two goals today. So first, we'll discuss this idea of power. What it is, how to use it, how it relates to energy and work. Secondly, we're going to compare two methods of solving problems. So now we have two big tools in our toolbox. One is energy conservation. The other one is forces, free body diagrams, Newton's second law, and then in conjunction with that, constant acceleration equations. So we can, we've spent a lot of time on both of those. Are they both equally good, or is one better than the other in particular situations? We'll look at three scenarios and compare. So first, power. So average power is the rate at which work is done. If you simply divide the work by the time required to perform the work, then you've got the power. So there's our power equation, capital P for power. It's work over time, or W over T. So got to be a little careful there with the W standing for work because the W also stands for the unit of power, which is the watt. So one watt is one joule per second. Okay, so power is change in energy divided by the time interval. Here's some different units. We tend to work in watts, but you've probably also heard about horsepower. Well, one horsepower is 746 watts, and in the old English system it's 550 foot-pounds per second. You can also write power in terms of velocity, okay? So we said things like work is magnitude of the force, magnitude of the displacement times cos theta. We've got a very similar equation for power, except instead of displacement, we have velocity. So power is also a scalar quantity. It is the magnitude of the force multiplied by the magnitude of the velocity multiplied by the cosine of the angle between those two vectors, the force and the velocity. If the force and velocity happen to be parallel, then you simply get F times V. But just like with work, the sine on the power, or the work, comes from the cosine theta factor. What about us? How much power can we put out? We'll find the average power. So, we'll assume our daily output is the same as our daily input, which is, let's just call that 2,500 calories. Well, food calories, capital C calories, are actually kilocalories, so that's 2.5 times 10 to the 6 lowercase calories. A calorie is close to 4 joules, it's 4.186 joules, so that turns out to be 1 times 10 to the 7 joules. So we're taking in and putting out about 10 million joules in a 24-hour period. Now, if we simply divide that by the number of seconds in a day, we've got our power. So how many seconds are there in a day? Let's say 24 hours, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, gets you 86, 400 seconds. We'll round that off to about 100,000. So if you divide your energy output, 1 times 10 to the 7 joules, by time which is around 10 to the 5 seconds, you get about 100 watts. In other words, we're about as bright as your average incandescent light bulb. Okay? Now, that averages over the entire 24-hour period, including when you're asleep. So there are times of the day when you can put out a lot more power than that. And for instance, you know, if you're biking in the Tour de France and you're going up one of those incredibly big hills, you can put out a few hundred watts or even several hundred watts as just for a short amount of time. Okay, so let's turn over to the second point of this video, which is comparing energy versus force and constant acceleration methods. So again, these are two enormous tools in our toolbox here. So, let's say we have this problem. We'll look at three different cases. Here's the first one. So we've got a, a box that slides down a frictionless ramp, starts from rest. We know how far it goes along the ramp. We know the angle of the ramp. We can calculate the height from that, for instance. Let's say we want to know the speed of the block at the end. Which approach should we use? Is energy good? Force, constant acceleration better? Let's see. So, 
we could certainly do energy, absolutely. Okay, we just get mgh is one half mv squared. Force, absolutely. Okay, so you could draw a free body diagram, figure out the acceleration, put it in your constant acceleration equations. They are both pretty good. Okay, scenario two. Now we want to know how much time it takes this block to slide down the ramp. Okay, so what approach should we use there? Well, you cannot use energy just all by itself. Okay, because the deal with energy is it's great for relating speeds and positions, but it really doesn't have any time information in there at all. Okay, so you could take the, the V you get, the speed you get from the energy equation and throw it in some constant acceleration equation and get time, but energy all by itself can't do it. Whereas force and constant acceleration equations, no problem, no problem at all. Okay, how about this case? Ball hangs down from a string, the ball is pulled back and released from rest, and then it acts like a pendulum oscillating back and forth. So, what do we know? We know the length of the string, we know the angle the string makes with the vertical when the ball is released from rest. We want to know the ball's maximum speed during its swing, which of course is when the ball goes through its equilibrium position when the string is vertical. So what approach should we use? Energy, perfect for this, okay. MGH is one half mv squared, calculate the v. Force, well, not so good in this particular case. The reason for that is the acceleration is not constant. So we're very good at applying constant acceleration equations, but if the acceleration is not constant, then we can't really do that. So energy is superior in this particular case. So you really want to think about whether you want to use one approach or the other, which one's easier, which one is more appropriate, if anyone is in a particular case. And that is the end of our session today.